Hi, welcome to John Brakes Watches. And on the bench today, I have a relatively new, well, fashion pocket watch with a mechanical movement, which starts and stops at random and can't keep time properly when it is running. This case design shows up fairly often in a range of design-focused pocket watches, costing maybe $20 and upwards, with both quartz and mechanical options. And while they're perhaps not heirloom quality watches, Many of them have some cool designs and are attracting a new generation of owners to the otherwise archaic pocket watch. The movement inside, well, it's a Chinese 2650G skeleton style movement, which costs around $20 from a number of sellers in the US. I'm sure you can find it for less elsewhere. And this particular movement dates from around 2021, so not quite in the vintage category yet. Nonetheless, the movement has 19 jewels, um, it's time only, no calendar complications or anything like that. It's a mechanical wind. It does have a center seconds hand. And most impressively, the claim to fame on one website is that it's compatible with an ETA 7750. Um, I would be slightly upset if one of those was put in instead of 7750, but there you go. It's really a watch movement, um, but it's mounted inside a hunter case in this, in this case. Um, has a long stem and since it has a central second hand it doesn't seem to have mounting points for dial feet so rotating it with the stem at the top is a pretty simple design choice of course the irony here is that a hunting case would typically have the stem at the three o'clock position anyway which suits this watch movement perfectly but who am i to criticize so now it's uh it's open you can probably see that the movement's much smaller than the case, the case would make it seem from the outside. It's held in with a plastic bezel, and obviously that long stem allows you know, winding from the outside, even though it's quite a long way from the outside of the case to the actual movement. So let's get into it. I'm going to start on the dial side and remove the dial side of the keyless works. I'll grab the intermediate gears and the minute wheel, the hour wheel and the cannon pinion. In this particular case, I'd normally use like a Presto tool or something like that to take off the cannon pinion. Um, on this watch, there's not really much of a place to let the cannon pinion, to let the Presto tool push on in order to remove the cannon pinion. So I actually end up using tweezers as carefully as I can to try not to damage the cannon pinion. But I use tweezers to remove it because I need to use as flat leverage as possible. So obviously I should go and get one of these expensive tools, but what are you going to do? I will apologize in advance. Um, I lost some camera footage and you may see rather too much of this particular angle, which is unfortunate because it doesn't always show you the most, but it's what we've got and it's better than nothing, I hope. So I'm going to gently let down the mainspring. You sure didn't hear it go whizz just then. No, nope, no, no, that was just your imagination. And having done that, I can get on and uh, remove the balance. The balance complete, in fact. This particular movement doesn't have the little handy slots that some movements have uh, underneath the bridges and cocks, which just allow you to wedge a screwdriver in and just lift the plate up a little bit. Um, so on this one, I'm going to end up having to use a, a screwdriver to try and try and get into that gap, or try and create a gap to get into. There's me staring at it. Where is it? Okay, tiny screwdriver. There you go. Just enough just to lift it up so that I can grab it. And out she comes, and we'll put her upside down on the mat. Uh, try and arrange the balance wheel so that the pivot is actually into the pivot hole as it sits there. I'm trying to keep it as, as flat as possible so I don't damage the hairspring either. I haven't yet got into the school of uh, releasing the hairspring from the balance before removing everything. Maybe one day. Next up, I'm just removing the click, <coughs> which is just screwed in, and it's all in one piece and acts as its own spring. So it's quite a nice little, nice little design. 
At the very least, it works. Oh, there it is. Next up, we'll attack the ratchet wheel and the crown wheel. They're both sitting on top of the mainspring bridge, the barrel bridge. So they're fairly easy to take off at the same time. So next task is removing the train bridge. So this is covering the escape wheel, the third wheel and the fourth wheel. And the fourth wheel on this movement is used to drive the second hand. So it's actually concentric with the center wheel or AKA the second gear. And this bridge over the top of them has jewels for, as I say, third, fourth and the escape wheel for the top of those pivots. Sometimes I find that when the screws are tough to get out, sometimes putting some pressure downwards on them at the same time is just kind of enough to, to break them free rather than just putting rotational force on it, which risks tearing the screw head off, I find sometimes pushing down um, seems to work fairly well. So out comes the fourth wheel. You see the very long shaft on that, because that's going through to the other side of the, of the dial. There's the third wheel comes out. The escape wheel I can't quite get to yet, um, but it'll come out soon enough. Next up, I'm removing the barrel bridge. It is a little bit tricky picking pieces out of a skeleton movement. Um, like when you're trying to get a bridge up and you need to kind of lever it up somehow, um, there's nowhere to lever that isn't kind of thin metal and you're worried about bending it. Um, you kind of get spoiled when you have these solid main plates. Um, and, and very solid parts, whereas this is kind of a lightweight movement, it's skeletonized, so wherever the metal's not needed, it's being cut out to look better. Um, it does make it a little bit more challenging to actually work around the watch like that. It's all about the looks. Okay, so out comes the barrel with the mainspring in it. And this barrel's kind of interesting. The other side of it is cut out. You can see it's, they've even skeletonized the barrel. So next I'm removing the center wheel bridge. Um, this has a jewel in it with quite a large hole um, because the center wheel has, is basically hollow. The, the shaft is hollow so that the fourth wheel can push the shaft all the way through to the other side. Um, so this center wheel bridge basically holds that, it holds the center wheel in place so that the fourth wheel has something stable to push through. Alright, finally out come the screws from that bridge. Hooray! And let's get the bridge out. It seems like it was a while ago that we said this, but this is a center wheel bridge second wheel bridge if you really want but it's centered therefore it is a center wheel and there it comes there's that bridge a little L, little uh, kinked piece of kinked piece of metal with just the one jewel two screw holes and a jewel and the jewel is for the center wheel
guess I'll leave the center wheel there for a minute until everything around it loosens up. So next I'll instead I'll take off the uh, pallet fork cock and as I probably said before it's a cock because it has a single screw holding it in. If it has two screws it would be a bridge and that varies from movement to movement whether it's a bridge or a cock. I'll just make a note of that screw because it's a little bit different from some of the others in terms of size. It'll help me remember later. And out comes the pallet fork cock with the pallet fork stuck to it. And that's not really a great sign. It suggests that they may have oiled the pallet fork pivots. Um, and we don't do that now, do we, boys and girls? No, we don't. At least that's what I've come to understand. You can probably just about see on that pallet cock that there's one screw hole and there are two other holes which go on to little pins, little nubs that stick up from, from uh, one of the plates that just help position the cock. I'm not sure that really makes it a bridge, but it could be a pallet fork bridge maybe even though there aren't screws. I guess it doesn't hang in midair. Maybe we'll call it a bridge. Out comes that center wheel with the hollow shaft. And I've flipped the movement over here, back to the dial side. And we're gonna push through some of the setting mechanism and the winding mechanism there. So that that's the sliding clutch and the gear from the keyless works. And then basically I've got the setting mechanism left to take out here. So this is where the stem's pushed in. This is the mechanism that allows you to pull the stem out and click. And now you're setting the time, push it back in, click. Um, and now you're winding the watch instead. I'm using the plastic pokey stick thing. Um, to try and make sure that the yoke spring does not become a part of uh, the NASA space program. Already got the yoke out and that looks like a setting lever coming out. Hooray! So that should be everything taken off the watch. Quick check. Oh, he looks lovely. Still, you can never check it over too much. Let me uh, make sure I got all the bits out. Now ah, you see, that's the button that that allows you to remove the winding stem. Always good to check this stuff before it goes into the cleaning process and then bits get dropped out where you didn't expect them to be, especially small parts. And so there it is all laid out. It does look beautiful. It's a nice looking spring, main spring. And now it's time to take all these beautiful parts, which are actually fairly clean, but we're going to clean them anyway, since it looks like there may have been oil where it didn't ought to have been. And we're going to put all this stuff into containers so that I can run it through my ultrasonic. Uh, basically, I wash them in a ultrasonic watch cleaning solution. Um, and then after that, they get put in a rinse solution um, just water in this case and then they go through a second somewhat cleaner red solution and then after that they all get dried using warm air. You notice me there just sliding the balance back on to the main plate and spinning freely and we do that just to try and protect it somewhat while it's uh, protect the hairspring especially while it's in the cleaner and bumping up against everything else. So with everything out of the cleaner, it's time to start reassembling, and I'm bravely starting with the yoke spring. I'm going to speed up the reassembly process in places um, so that my inevitable hesitation can be reduced to something more like watching Benny Hill. And if you understand that, we can probably identify both your age and your nationality with reasonable confidence, and we should be friends. 
you know, this watch is really quite a puzzle and perhaps kind of an, an anachronism of sorts. I mean, so pocket watches are old fashioned, right? Who wants this watch on a chain when we all have mobile phones in our pockets and smart watches on our wrists and very few of us wear like waistcoats anymore. So I'm not even sure where you'd anchor the chain and store the watch when you carry it. But I guess what's old is new. So I suppose in the way of all things fashion, it does make sense that the market for new pocket watches has come around again. If you try a search on Amazon, for example, for pocket watch, you'll be presented with page after page of options running between $5 at the low end um, up to $9,600, mostly by brands that you've never heard of before and likely will never hear of again. And let's face it, who wouldn't pay $27 for a, and I quote, real poo irregular brown octagon pocket watch? I mean, it's a conversation starter, but I'm not sure I'd be proud to tell my friends about it. Back though to the many watches available, there's a definite fascination for skeleton watches. And once you recognize it, you'll find that this Chinese 2650 movement features in many of them. It's available in a silver color as well as this uh, brassy gold color. These are definitely, they're 100% fashion statements, but with some incredible case and dial designs to suit all tastes. And not just as one might have expected, lots of pictures of trains. You can even get your own custom photo put on the back of some cases. And apart from maybe putting my face on the back of a pocket watch case, I totally understand the attraction of these designs. They're different. And when everyone's walking around with fundamentally the same mobile phone, different is good. Different is interesting. And as somebody interested in mechanical watches, should I care that people are buying them as fashion statements? I mean, okay. I'd like to educate people on how cool mechanical movements are compared to a quartz movement and encourage them to choose accordingly. But beyond that, yeah, I'm a member of a pocket watch group on social media and recently uh, another member had posted some of their newly acquired pocket watches, all of which appeared to be new watches in the Amazon style. And somebody else commented that these aren't the kind of watches we normally talk about here. So what? These pocket watches are getting people to look away from their phone and their computer and their smartwatch and they're buying a timepiece. I'd like to hope that these cheap pocket watches, especially the mechanical ones, are a gateway to understanding more about watches in general. And maybe these folks will end up getting hooked on vintage watches as well. And if they just want watches as a fashion statement, that's fine. Understand that a $30 watch is going to have a cheap movement in it. Enjoy the looks of the watch, because there just aren't vintage watches out there that look like the majority of these new timepieces. I'm just pleased that people are showing interest. Although, if they could stay off the auction sites and not put my prices up on vintage stuff, that would be cool too. My son, by the way, has about five of these watches and honestly I quite like them. This watch that I'm working on is his and his frustration that it couldn't run for a whole day was important because he was actually using it. How cool is that? My teenager wants to use a pocket watch despite having an iPhone in his pocket. So I took the opportunity to dig into it and see if I couldn't make it better knowing of course that if I couldn't I could ultimately replace the movement very easily. My point is though, if I have one, don't look down on people for buying these new pocket watches. Encourage them, help them understand what they're buying, how cool a mechanical movement is and how it works. And encourage them to understand more. And you never know, these might be the next generation of watchmakers. My son, by the way, he tolerates my explanations about watch movements, but happily admits he's buying based on looks and that's fine. I mean, look, Swatch have made a fortune selling to that exact market for years, right? There you go. Rant over. So, while I've been talking, 
ranting. I've put in the center wheel and the escape wheel. And now I'm putting on the fourth wheel, which as I mentioned earlier, that's gonna go through the hollow shaft of the center wheel and go all the way through to the other side so that a seconds hand can be attached to it. Now, if you think of a normal pocket watch, um, they'll often have a fourth wheel that's positioned at the 6 p.m. location, and that's why we have a separate second hand. Um, rather than being concentric, and they just put it in a place that was appropriate for the gear design, for the train of gears. Now, the observant among you, if you could ignore my rant, might have noticed a little mistake I made. So let me explain what I did wrong and why I took the fourth wheel back out again. So here's a nice zoomed in picture. You can see I've got the center wheel in place. What should have come next but didn't is the center wheel bridge. I had it sitting on the surface the whole time. I'm an idiot. But that's what should have been there. And it was a fatal mistake. And it's important because actually that's what gives stability to both the center wheel and then the fourth wheel that's going to go through that above it. Without that, everything's going to be wibble wobbling all over the place. So let's get the third wheel in. It's a little bit tricky to put in, but on the end of the shaft, the third wheel has a small pinion around the bottom, and that's going to interlock with the second wheel, the center wheel gearing. So that's how the that's how the uh, rotation is transferred, how the motion's transferred into the third wheel. And then when we put the fourth wheel on, and well, that'll go on in the center there, that also has just underneath the main wheel at the top, just on the shaft underneath that, it has a small pinion. And as we push this down, that's then going to mesh with the third wheel next to it. And the equally, again, observant among you may have noticed another mistake, which is that when I recreated my crime scene, I forgot to put the escape wheel in. It should go right there. And on the top of the escape wheel shaft, it has a small pinion as well that comes up and meshes with the fourth wheel. And that's the gear where it meshes there. And so again, that's how the motion gets through that centered fourth wheel down into the escape, escape wheel so that that can pass onto the pallet fork. And so this is the bridge that would go on top that should be also over the escape wheel, but you can see the jewels are gonna go on the fourth wheel and the third wheel. So let's get back to our previous state. This is when the train bridge is going back on um, and holding those pivots in place and that missing escape wheel. They're all gonna meet their jewels in that, in that train bridge. In goes fourth wheel, hooray. Yeah, slide that in at the same time, why not? We'll get the barrel in place, doesn't hurt. And I'm just gonna hold the bridge with peg wood to try and stop it wobbling around just while I get it onto those pivots. And once everything looks like it's rotating freely, I'll get the screws up there and put them in loosely and then recheck. So we're looking good, I'll get the screws in. Just think you can get those plastic kids uh, rotating gear sets of toys. And I look back and think, boy, what a missed opportunity to teach watchmaking. So now I'm rebuilding the keyless works, putting in a uh, winding gear and the sliding, cr sliding clutch. And then we'll grab the stem in a second and give it a quick test. There's a plate that goes over the top of this that helps hold things in place. Um, until then, actually, the stem's really useful to align the parts and to make sure they don't fall out. All right, and that is the barrel bridge that's got the Part of that plate is covering the, you can see there is just covering the keyless works. And 
and we'll screw that down. These ones are much easier to screw down. They're much less concerning than, uh, than the ones with pivots. I don't want to break the pivots off. I did do that on some very early watches I played with. I'm getting overconfident about pieces being in place and then realizing I'd smashed the jewel. Um, not advisable. So now the barrel bridge is on, I can start working on the crown wheel and the ratchet wheel. Uh, and I do find it reassuring, by the way, when I play these videos back to see that I've got a little gear sitting on the mat, lonely. We don't know why it's on the mat yet, it just is. So the crown wheel, as with most crown wheels, um, has a left-handed thread. So that means you're going to turn it counterclockwise to tighten it up, or anti-clockwise if you're in the UK. Um, and that's not a problem, but as I tighten that up, I do start to notice that something's not quite right here. Seems that the I tighten it up and it, everything seems to be in place, but the ratchet wheel seems to be a bit loose. So we'll try this and see see if it's working properly. Yeah, sort of. But then it's not working and then it is and it's not. So I've made a rookie mistake. Usually on the crown wheel, on most watches, there is some kind of one or more ring or, or inner rings that go around the pivot that it's that it's gonna sit on. And on this one, I forgot to put it back in. And basically that means that the, the big hole in the middle of the crown wheel was too big, so it was able to slide back and forward, despite the screw. And this is here in part because, unlike the ratchet wheel, where the screw turns with the wheel, on the crown wheel the screw stays still, and it just holds everything down, and you want the crown wheel to be able to rotate underneath it. So that little ring gives it the detachment between the screw and the wheel itself so that it can rotate properly. Easy fix though. Just put the ring in and let's do it up again. And there we go. And there's that counterclockwise screwing. And we'll try it again. There we go. That looks much better. I love seeing the gears turn. That's my happy place. Okay, pallet fork time. And we'll get the pallet fork bridge in on top of that. Decided we'll call it a bridge for now, but I guess it is. It has two points of contact. So ignore the pallet fork cock stuff. We'll just go with bridge. And so we'll get that tightened up, hopefully not crunching anything, and then we'll find out whether or not, with a bit of a wind in it, whether or not the energy is getting through to the pallet fork. And I'll just use a, a brush on this to just gently nudge it back and forward, and what should happen is the pallet fork should spring to the other side. And that's basically what it's doing. It's, uh, ping, yay. That's what it should do. Because it's going to get nudged by the balance wheel and when it does you want it to fly across to the other side so that it can push the push the balance wheel and spin it and then of course the balance wheel springs back the other direction and you rinse and repeat as it as the pallet fork flips back and forward and so that gently measures allows measured amounts of energy out each time it does that and that's also the uh, why you hear it ticking in mechanical watches. So now we'll put the the balance wheel, the balance bridge, so the balance complete basically. We'll put that back in and see if the watch will come to life again as I get the bridge located. Oh, yep, 
no yep yeah there we go just kick it off with a little twist and look at that that is the best feeling john didn't break watches today note in your diary really is one of the best feelings when you're repairing watches is when a watch comes back to life or even comes to life if you had one that was broken before and you've repaired it that really is an amazing feeling i, I just love seeing that happen more even uh, marshall would probably disagree over on wrist wristwatch revival that his one of his favorite things is uh, taking the mainspring winder and doing the pop as you push it out no for me it's that's fun but for me the balance wheel is definitely hit so on with the cannon pinion and then we'll get the rest of the dial side put in place the intermediate setting gears connecting the stem to the hands and we'll get the hour wheel and minute wheel in place and then on this watch they have a cover plate that you can just see on the left hand side down by my hand that goes over all of them make sure they don't you know, basically keep them held down because after all remember it's a skeleton watch as well you're not going to have the dial to hold anything in place so this has to hold everything down by itself and so that's what this this little top plate does Now we'll give it a full wind and put it on the time grapher and this is what we got it's gaining 39 seconds a day the amplitude's okay however after some tweaking this is what what we ended up with and i'd like to see a higher amplitude to be honest but the watch doesn't seem to stall the other positions i tried in tried it in they had small time loss or time gain i think they probably pretty much cancel themselves out but nothing too much to worry about from a 20 dollars movement and Given a full wind, the watch ran for 52 hours and kept good time the whole way. So I'm actually quite impressed. So that means I can recase the watch and I'll apologize for the even worse camera work in this section. I hope you enjoy looking at the follicles of the hairs on my hand. Um, but I'll first put the movement into that plastic spacer again. And then I'm gonna use the stem here just to make sure the movement's gonna rotate to the right place kind of test fitting the dial there okay I remember the dials held on with little dial stickies so I'm just using the stem to make sure that the movements aligned centered in in the watch holder or as close as I can get and then align the dial up so that the 12 and 6 are as straight as possible and that's actually sticking down to the plastic surround um, the entire watch movement is what you see in the middle of the dial so it looks like it's a bigger watch um, but actually, nope, that's all just dead space and the dial covers that plastic spacer. Now I can put on the hands. And we'll gently push that down. It's a little bit concerning with the skeleton, how strong those that support is in the main plate. But we'll just do a quick run around and make sure the hand's not sticking anywhere. And then we'll go select an hour to put it on. I think I ended up, I put it on two, yeah. So we'll set it pointing to two o'clock as best I can. It's actually quite a shorthand, so I'm having to kind of do my best to align it visually to point at the two. The good thing is if it's slightly off, my son isn't gonna notice. So now let's get the minute hand. Come on, it's hard to pick up. These Dorian tweezers are good, but they can be a little bit slippery sometimes may have to replace them with some wood ones and see if see if wooden ones work better so since we've got the hour hand pointing at an hour we're going to put the minute hand pointing to 12 o'clock so it's on the hour and that should mean the hands stay in the correct relationship to one another obviously if we had like a date mechanism or something like that we'd be having to make sure that the date had just flicked over and we set everything to midnight so that everything so that the date mechanism was aligned with the hands but in this case now whack as mate as they say it's all good and so we'll go and check this we'll go and see what it looks like at six o'clock to see if i got things aligned yeah 
that looks like a six and a, and a 12. They look pretty straight, so I think I'm good there. And we'll just finish running around to make sure the hands don't bang into each other anywhere. And this is where I would have put the second hand on. But as I grabbed it in my Delrin tweezers, which I mentioned are slippery, it pinged away into outer space and I wasn't able to get it back down to Earth for another three days, at which point I installed it. So just pretend like I'd done it. So I'm just going to use the tweezers now, take the button out, uh, push the button so I can take the stem out so that I can put the movement in the case. We'll give the inside of the glass a quick, uh, a quick clean down and a blowout and then off screen a little blow for the dial and let's just friction fit this plastic spacer inside the movement and we should be able to put the stem back in. I'm just going to push that button again to uh, in a second just to let the stem go back in easily. I think on a lot of these you can actually push them back in it's like a one-way latch but this one I felt like I'd have to push too hard I didn't want to break the stem because they can be quite flimsy. So push and in we go. There you go you just saw the stem push in that last last few millimeters. And now I can put the back on again give it a quick clean and a blowout because it's a see-through back as well right skeleton case I want to see everything and all it covers is the plastic spacer so that it's not obvious it's really a very clever design to use this what is basically a wristwatch movement uh, in a pocket watch case and it's done it is not a bad looking mechanical pocket watch for the price i kind of like the skeleton movement so I hope you've enjoyed the video. Uh, if so, please drop me a like, a comment, maybe even a subscribe, as it helps more people see the video. Either way, I hope you'll join me next time here on John Breaks Watches.